I don't think that Putin anticipated that it was going to go this way. Uh, I don't think anyone did, actually. I mean, if if you listen to the U.S. experts, they all predicted that Putin would succeed in taking over Ukraine in two days. And and I, I can remember, like, you know, all sorts of assessments from the Rand Corporation through to, you know, Brookings and all sorts of people making predictions that, you know, Putin could could basically um, r- roll all the way through and take Estonia in a couple of days. I mean, I, I've seen all this type of stuff. And so I think Putin was convinced of that. And I think the West was convinced of that. There, there weren't there weren't many people other than maybe the Ukrainians who were convinced otherwise. And so um, so his first huge miscalculation. And I, I don't think he was wrong to miscalculate it this way because, you know, who's to know how a different an army is going to work versus another army until you actually, you know, put it to the test. And then his other huge miscalculation is that um, he thought that we were going to do, we in the West, were going to do exactly what we had done every other time he did something terrible, which was nothing. You know, he he's invaded lots of places, done lots of tor- horrible things, and we do nothing. Not, nothing happened after Georgia. In fact, President Obama at the time just urged all sides to exercise restraint. There was no sanctions against Russia. Um, Georgia should after, exercise restraint. After, after Crimea, um, uh, we, we somehow were able to put, put the whole Crimea and eastern Ukraine thing into some weird box where we described it as Russian-backed separatists up until the today. I mean, I, I listened to the BBC and they, they described them as Russian-backed separatists. It was a Russian invasion. No, no, no if, and, or buts. It was a Russian invasion. This war didn't start on February 24th. This war started in 2014. And then because we were able to put it in this weird little box calling it Russian-backed separatists, we didn't then have to unleash the full weight and force of economic sanctions against Putin. Um, and, 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 and we did this, and this was all very sort of, uh, you know, if you want to blame something on the West, you can blame the West on not being robust in response to all this, these terrible things that, that Putin has done. There, I think the West deserves, you know, serious blame to, to somehow be so interested in Russian gas and, and Russian money flowing into various economies. We, we came up with all sorts of convolutions to, to, to describe it as something so that we didn't have to do what we just have done. And, and, uh, so Putin made this calculation thinking that we were going to do exactly the same thing with Ukraine. So for him, you know, you're, you're an investment guy. You know, most decisions are all about risk reward. And and uh, and this decision was about risk reward as well. And there and there was a big reward for Putin. The re, uh, and the reward was that he, he he's sitting there pretty scared, actually, af- after two years of covid where everyone was suffering mightily on an economic front in Russia um, after his approval ratings are sort of stagnant and going down. Pension reforms were very painful too. I think that's probably part of the calculus. And then he's watching his um, neighbor, uh, an- another dictator, Nazarbayev. Uh, no one's paying much attention to that. But in Kazakhstan, a dictator who'd been around longer than Putin and in proportional terms to his country had been even more of a kleptocrat, got washed out over a period of four days when they raised gas prices. And so Putin, he was pretty desperate to do something, and he he did this, and he did the calculation saying that this will that solidify his position for the next four or five years by doing an invasion, and chances are he'll succeed, and chances are that the West will do nothing, and that was his basic calculus. And and for, for what it's worth, he's gotten the first part of the equation right. His approval ratings have gone through the roof. I mean, it's it's weird and it's shocking to speak to. Um, Russians in Russia, who are all like parroting the nonsense, uh, you know, narrative that he's he's put out there, and and are all feeling very sort of bullish on Putin. I probably have a personal anecdote you might be interested in that. I mean, I grew up in Belgrade, Serbia, so I can remember that you know Belgrade never voted for Slobodan Milosevic. It was always kind of the liberal, kind of like Moscow and Saint Petersburg, always had a very difficult relationship with uh, the regime. But in 1999, when NATO bombed, you know, Serbia. Um, you know, you had anthropology professors and theater directors taking their children and printing out little targets and going through bridges and, and saying, like, we're all targets of NATO bombing. So the entire liberal intelligentsia of the country actually um, said, you know, like, no, like, now that the West hates us all and bombs us, we're going to stand together. But that moment, Bill lasted like six months, right? And I think, uh, I guess my view here is like, let's say six months from now, 
Russia accomplishes very minimal goals from their original wants. They get the Donetsk Luhansk region, which is basically West Virginia of Europe. So, you know, what does the winner get? Um, and I mean, six months from now, when those same people that you talk to who are parroting the, the view, when you look around them and say, was it worth it? Don't you think that there will be a letdown? Just like there was in Serbia. I mean, Slobodan Milosevic fell to a revolution 12 months after basically the native bombings. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, I, my, my prediction is that if the Ukrainians succeed in driving the Russians out of Ukraine, and I'm not sure exactly how to define that, but in a way that's really obvious, that, that effectively Russia has lost the war and there's no way that they can spin it otherwise, um, I don't think the Russian people will um, keep Putin around any longer. But, you know, he's got a lot of this nationalist stuff up his sleeve, and he's probably a lot better at this than than Milosevic. And, um, uh, you know, as you said, people in 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 Belgrade didn't vote for Milosevic, but um, in in, peop in Russia, people don't vote. <laughs> I mean, they might vote, but not, but it, it, and so P Putin has got a lot more sort of dictator totalitarian tools that's up true. his sleeve to uh, that's to, true. to, uh, keep, yeah. to keep this thing going. And he's pretty good at it. And so I wouldn't I wouldn't count on like a uh, popular uprising anytime soon. I, the, the, the more relevant example, I think, is the Kim Jong Un example, where you know Putin could create a total pariah state, which he's done, and um, and he could carry on, you know, impoverishing his people and being doing what he's doing for a very long time. I mean, it's it's entirely plausible, and I would say that that's the that's sort of the base case scenario. That's 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 what's most likely to happen is that he just this thing goes on for a long time. He, he keeps control through total oppression and totalitarian rule. And, um, you know, we could be having this same conversation two years from now. Um, so I want to switch to probably one of my favorite scenes in your books. So in Red Notice, which is a fascinating read, uh, you know, you have this moment where you're a young guy investing in Russia and you find uh, an undervalued asset. You get super excited. You plow into it. And then Vladimir Putanin, who is currently the biggest oligarch um, goes after it and wants to dilute your shares. And what I was fascinated by this moment, because I reread your book ahead of you know, talking to you. And so now I'm reading it in the context of what's going on in Ukraine. And the most fascinating part of that story was the fact that your Western partners that own 50% of your firm go behind your back and are like, listen, kid, like, just cool it. We're going to go talk to like the adults are going to now talk. You know, undermining your position because you wanted to go to the courts, you wanted to use the state, you wanted to use institutions to defend your stake. And they undermine that endeavor. And it reminds me of this kind of like disunity in the West. You know, yeah. um, and, and then you conclude that chapter with probably some of the best assessment of Russian mentality. But as an Eastern European, I can say, I think more broader than, than Russian, which is that, you know, it's like a prison yard out there. You know, and uh, and you basically say like, look, within like twelve hours of coming into a prison, you got to punch someone in the face, and you can't back down. And that's something you learn as a six-year-old going to school in in the schoolyards of where I'm from. I wonder, you know, isn't that really the biggest lesson of this whole thing? That that aggression from Russia is just the way things are. It like they're not going to be me mad at us if we're aggressive back. It's just meant to be like that. You have to. Uh, be much more forceful to gain respect and to ensure that they take you seriously. And, and do you think the West has actually done that? Well, I mean, no. I mean, and, and, and it's really annoying to me when I listen to Biden speaking about whether or not, for example, to do a no-fly zone in Ukraine. And he's, he's saying, we will not go to war with Russia. We have no interest in going to war with Russia. We, had, we don't want to provoke Russia. He should just keep his mouth shut. I mean, you know, the only thing that Putin understands is a boot on the neck, and and there's no there's no negotiation, there's no compromise. It's just pure who's more powerful than who, and and so in my opinion, um, probably there should be a no-fly zone. We should go in there, and we should say to the Russians, and we and when I say we, I mean NATO. We should say to the Russians, we're declaring a no-fly zone. Any jets that enter Ukrainian airspace will be shot down. If you want to try it, we'll shoot it down. And then let's see what happens. And if they enter Ukrainian airspace and we shoot one down, then what do they do? Do they decide they want to go to war with the whole world? I don't think so. Because as you say, it's all about, you know, who's bigger, who's tougher, who's more powerful. It's the, it's the prison yard. It's not all this sort of political science, international diplomacy stuff. 
I, I, you know, the way I, the way I describe it, this is more of an organized crime story than it's a um, political science story. Yeah, and I think that's that's something that's a very interesting angle here. Uh, you know, it's it's much more of a a personal story too. And uh, if the point is preservation of power, you know, if that's the point to preserve the regime in power, then obviously nuclear weapons don't really make sense. And now a lot of people have talked about this, you know, and and I just have to tell ask you what you think about it. Uh, no fly zone leads to some sort of an outbreak of a World War Three. Uh, I mean, how how does one defend that view? How do you how do you explain that to the public? Like, hey, we're going to impose a no fly zone over Ukraine. I mean, 60, 70 percent of Americans are going to balk at that and say, like, what are you talking about? Don't, aren't we going to end up in a nuclear war? Well, so so the, the answer is we might very well end up in a nuclear war without doing that. I mean, so here's my worst case scenario is that somehow Putin um, achieves his objectives in Ukraine. I don't know how he does that, but let's just say for the for the sake of argument that he does. Um, if I'm correct, and I'm pretty sure I am correct, that the reason he's going to war is not because of um, NATO enlargement or grand visions of Soviet or Russian imperialism. He's going to war to stay in power. He's got to stay in war. And he's not going to stop with Ukraine. And, and, and the Ukrainians have said this very clearly, and I completely agree with uh, Zelensky, which is, you know, he'll, he'll be at the border of Estonia. And let's just say he's at the border of Estonia and he's pointing his guns at Estonia and he's pointing a couple of nuclear weapons at London... Berlin and, and Washington, then what? You know, then we are at war. And, and then he's, and he wants to test us out. He wants to see, okay, are, are, are you guys ready? You know, he, are you guys ready to go to war with me? And, and he's, he's anticipating and expecting and hoping that all of a sudden on CNN and MSNBC and Fox News, all the pundits are there saying, well, wait a second, um, why would we risk losing 20 million lives for the sake of a country that of 2 million people or a million people that we can't even locate on a map? That's what he that's what he's hoping for. And so I, I think it's kind of obvious that that it, in order to prevent that, we need to stop him well before then. We need to grind him down. And the best way to grind him down is to give the Ukrainians every possibility of winning their war. And if we do that, the best thing we can do is stop the air, airplanes from bombing. And if we stop the airplanes from bombing, we give them a military advantage, which which may lead to the total defeat of Putin's army in Ukraine. And so I, I say we already are in World War III. It's just a question of how you define it. And we, we should try to do everything possible to stop it from expanding to a, a formal war with us. And let's just do it this way.